When people talk, uh, talk about the 7th of October attack by Hamas, as horrific as that was, it didn't happen out of... It, it, didn't, it didn't happen, happen in a vacuum. Of, um, Zionist leaders themselves viewed Zionism in this interwar period and before in settler colonial terms. Do you believe that uh, the settler atrocities against Native Americans may have also helped North Americans in general turn a blind eye to the settler colonial policies that Israel uh, implemented. So hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Book Cafe podcast. My guest for today's episode is Professor Dr. Martin Bunton from the University of Victoria, all the way from British Columbia, Canada. And in today's episode, we will primarily be discussing his 2013 book, The Palestinian-Israeli Conflict, a very short introduction. But first, uh, let me do my due diligence by welcoming our guest. So Professor Dr. Martin Bunton, welcome to the show. It's really great to connect with you. Well, thank you for having me, Omar. Mm-hmm. Okay, so Professor, before we just get into the book, um, we here at Book Cafe Podcast love to know about our authors just as much as we love to know about the book that we're discussing. So for the sake of our viewers and listeners who haven't read the book yet, and who may be discovering you as well for the very first time, uh, do please take this opportunity to tell us just a little bit more about yourself, specifically with regards mm-hmm. to your um, education and academic background. Yep. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for that, Omar. Um, maybe 30, 40 years ago, I started traveling and I spent quite a bit of time in Jerusalem, in East Jerusalem. Um, that was after my BA, before my master's program. I spent almost a year in Jerusalem and traveling around a fair bit. And then in 1990, so I was able to start my graduate studies uh, at Oxford in England, working with an incredible number of phenomenal mentors and supervisors from whom I benefited greatly. Um, At that time, um, I was particularly interested in uh, histories of British imperialism um, and the uh, construction of what is thought of as the colonial state. Um, Most of my studies at the BA level uh, were in African history. So what I ended up doing is taking my interest in colonial administrations and applying it to the Middle East. And at that point, then thinking about Palestine in the interwar period as a case study. So I ended up working on a a PhD on um, uh, land issues in Palestine, uh, property rights, questions uh, that I found fascinating. Maybe not everybody does, but cadastral surveys and maps and banking and credit and loans and taxation and these and and, and the land market, land sales. And so I did my PhD in that. And uh, um, uh, and then th- th- that was my first book that was published, although I also have a series of documents on land legislation in Palestine also. Mm-hmm. Um, my wife is from Victoria, BC. So in the late 90s, came back here. And that's important because when I got a job here at the University of Victoria, uh, the University of Victoria is, uh, had a, has, has a real focus on public engagement, local engagement. So we had all sorts of programs like continuing studies and, and um uh, speakers Bureau that got faculty out into the community. And the reason I want to stress that in terms of the significance for this book is because for many years in the late 90s and early 2000s, I was sort of out in various community groups from high schools to uh, rotary clubs to church groups, etc. Um, talking about the history of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict in, you know, 40 minutes or less. And it was with that experience that I was sort of distilling the significance of history. I always wanted to stress the importance of history history and historical context for understanding this conflict. Maybe we can talk more about that later. And I sort of stumbled upon this way of distilling the major turning points to years ending in seven. Mm -hmm. Um, And and even more interesting that these years ending in seven tended to be separated by 20-year periods of time. Mm-hmm. So 1897, 1917, 37, 47, 67, 87. Now, th- that's not to say those are the only significant turning points, but it offered a structure which made it more straightforward for an audience um, where you can't assume too much in terms of their knowledge and uh, mm-hmm. and maybe think a little bit about misconceptions that you're trying to correct. Mm-hmm. And so with that structure in mind, I thought I had a little, con- I had an interesting organization that um, I, I that that I then took and presented to the Oxford um, very yeah, short sure. introduction series. Right. They did not have a Palestine Israel out yet. I mean, there are hundreds mm-hmm. and hundreds of these now. I don't know how many now. Uh, Eight hundred um, and forty-three. 
<laughs> well, Sorry, I, I counted that. <laughs> there might have been significantly less, you know, yeah. when I pitched this back in 20, mm -hmm. I suppose, but that was 2009 or something based right. on the previous decade of the box. So hopefully that helps a little bit in terms of um, my own experience trying to kind of, and, and so in that sense, I do want to thank all those audiences who put up mm -hmm. with me um, and and those early attempts to uh, to inform um, uh, to inform them, and I, I believe in that. I believe that um, uh, that there is a thirst, a curiosity of knowledge about this very important part of the world, in which in which Western countries are so closely engaged, and for that matter, responsible for in terms of the uh, uh, in ter terms of the tragedies unfolding across the region, mm -hmm. and um, and so to 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 develop this in small groups was important to me. Mm, yeah, absolutely. So, Professor, thank you so much for that uh, really wonderful introduction. I think it's a really uh, fa uh, fabulous preamble for the rest of the episode. And uh, right off the bat, I have to say that I am such a huge fan of the book. You know, um, uh, you know, we were very privileged to have had uh, Gideon Levy, the uh, Haaretz uh, journalist, the Israeli journalist, on the show a couple of episodes back. And he went on record as saying that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is such a complex reality that there's no one particular book that could possibly capture all of its nuances mm -hmm. and complexities. But having yeah. said that, I have to say that after reading this book, I think that uh, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, this particular book comes very close to encapsulating the, the whole conflict in less than 150 pages, no less. So um, so I, I have to ask you this, Professor, how challenging was it to actually condense the entire uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict into a what is uh, predominantly a short book, uh, a book of not more than 150 pages? Do tell us about that. I, I have that question a lot, especially from colleagues, right, because we tend to we tend to find it more difficult to edit material down than to expand. Right. Right? And how often do we submit articles to journals and they say, this is fine, but it's too long, too long. So right. um, I, in many ways, once I had that organizational structure, right? once I made that commitment to historical context, but also to understanding the, the various turning points that introduced new context that changed the parameters of this conflict, right? Mm -hmm. And in that sense, actually took on the task of problematizing it, right? That the contours of that this conflict were very different in the 30s than in the 60s than in the 80s than today. Yeah. Then, then I committed to these chapters. I knew that I had so many words to work with. I knew that each chapter was roughly the same. I knew I had an mm -hmm. intro and a conclusion and some other um, 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 ancillaries to the, to the book. So then I was committed to a certain number of words per chapter. And in a sense, that was somewhat liberating because I'd also then made a commitment that in order to inform I wanted each chapter to put forth a particular argument in terms of understanding that particular context, but I also knew I needed that I needed the index to include certain references to um, uh, uh, UN resolutions or battles or individuals, you know, that there had to be certain events that people would look to, they would pick up this book and quickly want to say, you know, uh, ask, look for a little bit more on a particular issue. So I knew that there's certain material that I needed to get into these chapters. I knew there's a certain argument. And then I knew that I only had 5,000 words. Mm -hmm. So where the sort of sense of liberation comes in is recognizing I can't do everything. You know, maybe another book I can or something of that sort. But for this task at this moment, I was limited to this. Uh, these are my priorities. Mm -hmm. And it made it easier to say, it, it made it easier to say, well, I, I simply cannot cover that material. I think the complexity um, is a really important issue. And that's really what I wanted to get at is that the complexity kind of is, is part of how the history is unfolded. What I've often referred to uh, in the book is that kind of Gordian knot. There are multiple levels of complexity to the way this conflict has evolved. Right. Um, on the other hand, um, we have to be careful not to use complexity as a sort of obfuscation for what has happened also, because in many ways, there are very straight, there are some very straightforward issues at play here. And so that was kind of one of the other big concerns I had was trying to set out a conflict in historical terms, you know, one thing happening another, while trying to also um, uh, 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 follow the threads of causation, right? mm -hmm. um, but to do so in a way that um, uh, uh, didn't um, didn't obfuscate the, the uh, a sense of of responsibility when 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 uh, 
of, of, of yes, there's complexities, but there's also straightforward ways of understanding who did what to whom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And uh, and just coming back to the structure of the book, Professor, I have to say that I have I've become a huge fan of the way you designed the entire book, uh, dividing it up into five twenty-year uh, time periods or blocks and one 10-year uh, time period. So this makes it really uh, easy for a lay historian or a lay audience or reader, somebody who has very little knowledge of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict to actually uh, follow the linear progression uh, up to, you know, uh, start from the from the starting year 1897 all the way to 2007, the, the time period that mm -hmm. you uh, capture in the book. Um, so in fact, let's start with uh, uh, 1897. What made 1897 such a pivotal year that you chose that as the starting point, apart from the fact that it's a year that ends yeah. in seven? So, yeah. Right, right. I have to be careful about that, right? And and just to say, I'm currently um, um, writing uh, this a, a, a revised second edition. Okay. And so the big question is, what do I do with 2007? Right. Um, without without it becoming a gimmick, right? Mm -hmm. Without it becoming a hook that that you don't want that to drive the material, right? So um, if I, um, uh, one thing just to kind of note about that um, historical context is, if we're to put it into more of a present, uh, uh, give it a, a role in the present, when people talk, uh, talk about the 7th of October attack by Hamas on Israel, right? right. Um, as, hor as horrific as that was, right? Um, one thing people often also will need to stress is that it didn't happen out of... It, it, didn't, it didn't happen, happen in a vacuum, of, right? Was, context in which that occurred, right? right? So the next question becomes, um, in understanding that historical context, and it's a tough question, mm -hmm. where does one start? Right? And, and in following those discussions, interestingly enough, people either go back to, you know, um, 1987, Intifada in Oslo, or the 1967 war, or the 1947 to 48 you know, fighting in the UN resolution. So so I kind of I, I'm hoping that that structure can actually pl play a role in people's explanations here. You go, how far back do you want to go? And of course, a decision that mm -hmm. historians or observers, analysts make about where they start. That's an important um, that that that's an important decision that people make, and and it will it will inform one's um, uh, analysis at that point. Okay. Right. Uh, as far as 1897 goes, so what I really wanted to do with this book is to suggest, is to counter these ideas, notions, and I hear it a lot here, Palestinians and Israelis, right? They Well, they're always fighting, they always will fight. Um, uh, the implication being it's it's because of re ancient religious rivalries mm -hmm. or ancient tribal conflicts or something of that sort, right? Mm -hmm. Also betraying a kind of weariness with the conflict. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, the weariness, I don't know if this conflict actually has an end, you know, and, and, and but I'm a historian, I won't answer that question, but I'm very pessimistic. Mm -hmm. But what I can argue is that it has a history. Mm -hmm. You know, many of these notions of um, uh, tribal or religious conflict are actually quite ahistorical, right? They suggest that it can be reduced to some kind of essences out there. So I wanted to say, no, there is a history and it may not have an end, but it has a beginning. I think that was an extremely important point to emphasize with this book. Right. Not only does it have a beginning, it has a modern beginning, right? Late 19th century. Right. And thirdly, that that beginning is in Europe. Mm -hmm. That is yeah. not actually, mm -hmm. it didn't yeah. actually, that the conflict as such didn't originate from the region itself. Right? Right. So yeah. that was some of the things I really want to stress about 1897 is uh, the first Zionist uh, mm -hmm. Congress in Basel, right, right. in Switzerland, yeah. mm -hmm. was that it was um, the formation of Zionism as a political program. Yes, there were antecedents, there was pre precedence to the, the ideas and mobilization mm -hmm. of Zionist thought, but yeah. 1897 was where it crystallized. And it did so in a European city in response to um, uh, forces uh, that were very European themselves, anti-Semitism, uh, as well as colonialism, imperialism, um, as well as nationalism. So these were all kind of modern forces re reinforcing this as a modern conflict and um, uh, of European origin, which I think is extre extremely important to note as well. Indeed, indeed. And uh, just for my knowledge, Professor, um, in 1897, during the first World Zionist Congress, how exactly did they define the, uh, the word Zionism? If you could just share that with us. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So the idea was, um, as, as developed by prominent leaders at the time, like Theodor Herzl, 
was this notion that um, assimilation, the idea of uh, Jewish communities becoming part of the modern state structures as they were evolving in Europe, wasn't mm -hmm. really an option for many Jewish communities because they would never be safe from the from the the history, the uh, centuries of pogroms, persecution, anti-Semitism that was faced. Uh, and so in that, in response to that, as well as, you know, aligning with these modern forces of nationalism, the idea that the world was made up of peoples, um, peoples could be uh, uh, distinct and uh, um, not only distinctly uh, demarcated, but then having done that should be allotted a piece of territory that would then align with that, that self-described nation mm -hmm. to become a nation state. Uh, and so this was the idea as it as it emerged. Now, Herzl wasn't actually convinced that this state had to be anywhere in particular. I think the idea was given the urgency of that need to protect Jewish communities um, from the persecution faced in Europe. He was open to different ideas, right? Uh, I think right. Argentina was presented, I think. Um, East Africa. Sinai, I think there are places in Africa, right? right. But then over successive uh, congresses that are held, the, the, the commitment is then made that, no, this has this ought to be in a place that they refer to as Palestine. Mm -hmm. Now, there was no Palestine as such at the time. This was all part of the Ottoman Empire. Right. People living there considered themselves increasingly as Ottomans with an Ottoman identity. And that mm -hmm. included the Jewish communities in Palestine at the time as well and, and throughout the Ottoman Empire. Um, but that um, uh, 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 they referred to it as Palestine, but they also understood it as a um, kind of Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, the land of, of, of biblical ancestry and that that would be a necessary draw to 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 Zionist immigration uh, from Europe to Palestine yeah indeed and uh, and you also mentioned in the book professor that uh, if hypo if uh, if Palestine wasn't uh, occupied at the time I mean if there wasn't a indigenous population that was already there we wouldn't be having this discussion today there would have been no conflict to talk about so just out of curiosity because I, I don't think you mentioned it in the book so since I have you right in front of me let me ask you this um, who actually came up with the slogan a land without a people for a people without a land was it uh, yeah, Lloyd was, George, yeah. the Prime Minister of Great Britain? No, you know, no, I or, think it was, um, yeah. it's often attributed to um, Israel Zangwill. So it okay. does have, I mean, it's a great question. Everything has a history. Phrases have a history, right? Right. So um, it's, uh, but but I, I'm, I stand cr I, to be corrected here, because even though it's often attributed to a particular individual, it might well have a longer genealogy that mm -hmm. indeed would go... I, what I appreciate about your suggestion there is to really link it back to British imperial discourses, right? Right. Because that whole idea of a land without a people for people without a land is so highly implicated in settler colonial histories and frameworks, right? Mm -hmm. We see this in yeah. North America, so we see this elsewhere, that these lands, uh, it's, they, not, they weren't necessarily... I, it doesn't really necessarily betray um, an ignorance of the fact that people lived there. Mm -hmm. What it betrays is um, uh, the feeling that the people who lived there didn't matter, mm -hmm. right? that they yeah. didn't, uh, they either didn't matter, that they mm -hmm. were, um, um, uh, they could be dismissed, or that their attachment to the land didn't matter, that they weren't necessarily using the land as productively as possible or in the way possible, that they didn't deserve to be there. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a, a very important um framework. The the reason I, I mean, it's a bit of a glib comment there, but I often think that people in the West with our own Western histories, there is, um, and people's own um, necessarily uh, 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 religious cultural backgrounds here, right? A sense of being uh, steeped to some extent in uh, Western religious traditions. There can be seen um, as something quite at the outset, maybe noble, um, uh, romanticized, um, significant about the return of Jews to the Holy Land, you know, as sort of, and, and yeah. some even, and we see this in the United States, a fulfillment of what they see as biblical prophecy. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think what's important is when we understand, when we try to understand what people are feeling that way, that you can still see that, you can still understand that as a noble or romantic idea, the return of Jews to the Holy Land after 2000 years of diaspora. Um, or And however that is framed in people's minds, whether that reflects a actual historical truth or not, doesn't matter because mm -hmm. these are the kinds of under, the truths that are understood. Yeah. Um, we also then also need to understand that the pop, that the that the place was populated and that could not happen except at the expense of the people who lived there. And that mm -hmm. can't be wished away. 
Right. Yeah, for sure, uh, Professor. Um, and uh, and I think that's really well said. So uh, obviously, uh, with the regards to the eighteen ninety seven to nineteen seventeen time period, so let's uh, let's go up to the uh, the fag end of the this uh, time period to nineteen seventeen. Yeah and talk about the Balfour Declaration. Now, uh, Britain hadn't actually gotten in possession of that territory until 1918, a year after they'd already declared that they were going to help facilitate a, a Jewish home in Palestine. So uh, from a, just from a moral perspective, Professor, I mean, I mean, it just goes to show that they probably didn't, uh, like you just said, that, you know, they probably didn't take the wishes of the indigenous population or the Arab population that was there at the time into consideration. So uh, do you believe that this was a form of inherent racism as well, that, uh, you know, uh, how on earth can one superpower, um, you know, promise a piece, a patch of land to another people without even asking the ones who are the current inhabitants yeah. of that particular piece of land that, hey, do you mind if we do this or what are your thoughts on this? So uh, perhaps you could uh, well, think, tell us about that. Yeah. I, I think you've said that as well as I could, but there's a lot there, right? So maybe I could just take some of that apart. Yeah. Um, I think if you look at Balfour himself, right, he says this, he says that, that the desires, the, the Zionism is more important than the wishes and desires of the mm -hmm. people who happen to inhabit that area, right? right. Yeah. And we know that Balfour himself was um, uh, uh, racist. I think racism is built into imperialism. I'm not trying to apologize for his beliefs, but I don't think it's particularly problematic or confrontational uh, uh, to say that. Right? Mm -hmm. um, he himself was responsible, interestingly enough, or uh, largely responsible for a 1905 piece of Im uh, uh, immigration legislation in Britain which prevented Jews from um, immigrating into England. So mm. the fact that he could, you could be Zionist and racist and anti-Semitic at the same time is an mm. important piece to understand. Yeah. And something that we can see in the United States to this day as well, I think, right? Mm. So there are these parallels across, oh, yeah. across yes. time. Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, oh. this, one thing to note is um, the, the declaration comes in November of 1917, and technically Britain um, invades and occupies at least the south of, of, of what becomes Palestine uh, the next month in December 1917. Mm. Right. So this is all yeah. kind of happening at the same time in terms yeah. of the, uh, the, the, the promises of that land, followed by the invasion and occupation of that land. Mm -hmm. um, one thing to, interesting to note, too, about that timing, 1917, is the promise comes well into the war, right? So mm -hmm. we need to understand that the timing of that promise, I think, very much in terms of the, 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 the constraints that Britain is facing in the third year of a grueling, grueling um, war. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are, in the words of one historian, you know, they're grasping at straws looking for some kind of support here. And in that context, they're making promises to everybody. And so I think we have to kind of understand the Balfour Declaration in that context, too. They'll be making promises to whoever they think in their own minds, right, can, will, um, can will best serve their interests. One, yeah. yeah, yeah, to serve their own interests. Right. And thank you for that, because at the end of the day, it's about the British Empire is about serving British interests. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I wouldn't over exaggerate, some do, the kind of um, romanticism or the idealism of Belfort here. Mm -hmm. I think that the, the reason that that that, that, that declaration was, in, was, was written mm -hmm. was because, and for that matter, Britain's commitment to the actual establishment of a Jewish national home. And when you do parse the Belfort declaration, they're not actually promising that much. You know, mm. Yeah, you know, look with favor upon the establishment of the facilitation of and something called a home, mm -hmm. but that it was at the end of the day, it was only going to happen as long as it served British interests. For sure. Um, and I just want to skip ahead to 1923 from 1917, uh, Professor, because um, there's something in the book that you've written, which I haven't read in any other book that I've come across, and I treasure any book that teaches me something new. So I'm just going to ask you this particular <laughs> question about 1923. Um, was that the year that uh, a Palestinian legislative assembly was mulled, but then it never actually came to fruition? Um, uh, please feel free to correct me if I got that right or wrong. No, Omar, thank you for asking about that, because at the same time, I'm trying to lay out a history that mm -hmm. doesn't assume too much in the part of the audience. I was hoping to add something mm -hmm. that people who otherwise knew the conflict could still kind of perhaps gain something from. And so yeah. that that was in part why I spent some time looking at these constitutional um, uh, discussions, uh, debates within under within the colonial state, and mm -hmm. why I also, I think, my, my introduction explained why I spent a bit of time talking about Ottoman mm -hmm. land laws. 
in the pre although I think this is extremely important. We can come back to that too. But yeah. when we talk about 1967, um, uh, it's interesting, right? That uh, for all of the uh, imposition of authoritarian power within a colonial state, colonial um, administration, the colonial interests were always facilitated by the establishment of some kind of mechanism of indirect rule, right? So that mm -hmm. could be prince of sheikhs or tribal chiefs or um, uh, kings and emirs in the Middle East, but also the idea of introducing something similar to um, constitutional monarchy from Britain. So in Britain, in um, both um, uh, Egypt and all in, in Iraq, they create, they create Iraq and then they mm -hmm. create Iraq as a, a constitutional monarchy and then they find a king and then there's a constitution that allows for a legislative assembly and elections and everything else. Now, with all that in mind, what's really key is at the same time as they're introducing all of these rules of constitutional democracy, they're introducing all the different mechanisms used to manipulate those, right? So that their people are in power and their influence is behind it. And none of that is, of course, lost on the Indigenous population that then inherits this upon independence. So... But the key, the interesting thing I thought about that, uh, con the, the lack of a constitution in the mandate period, and I drew here quite heavily on a work of a, an imperial historian known as D.K. Fieldhouse, that he noted this interesting situation where, where um, uh, Palestine was one of the few, the idea of partitioning a colony is actually quite rare, right? Mm -hmm. Upon independence, the leaders of these, of, of these countries tend to want to hang on to the borders as contrived and artificial as they were drawn by imperial interests. But that not only was Palestine partitioned, it's it's not in, in unique, but it's rare, was uh, Palestine also didn't have a, a constitutional government, right? So right, right. to the ex yeah. extent to which it's counterfactual, but the extent to which those um, the lack of a constitution played an important role. Rashid mm -hmm. Khalidi is another historian who's written on this in terms of the significance of the mandate period. It meant that when when after nineteen four after World War II and the Holocaust. Palestinians didn't have a leadership that mm -hmm. could present themselves as prime ministers or as finance ministers or as, you know, presidents, whatever have you. Now, of course, there's a lot of those are props under colonial rule. Nonetheless, they would have conveyed a certain kind of um, a position that when visiting London or you or New York or wherever, they would have been accepted in those roles. Right. And so yeah. it might have I think um, one could argue that it made it sort of easier to envisage a partition of Palestine because it wasn't kind of it hadn't formulated mm -hmm. itself in those institutional ways that yeah. other other places like Transjordan even or Syria, mm -hmm. which were in no way uh, significant. They were all a mandates under the League of Nations, but that yeah. they were able to present themselves in those ways. Also, it meant that uh, Palestinians and Jews within the mandate period didn't have real, didn't have organized uh, institutions with which they could start to mediate their differences within them and instead yeah. grew separately. Yeah, for sure, Professor. And I have to say that uh, the lack of uh, uh, legislative assembly or a constitution, as you put it, it really did help to derail their aspirations for self-determination uh, down the line. And I think that this is something that I really appreciated reading about in the book because, um, you know, it's it's sort of glossed over or maybe it's not given as much importance as you've given it in the book. So I, I really thank you for that. So, uh, so Professor, we've, uh, we've gone from 1897 to 1917. So the next time period is 1917 to 1937. And let's talk a little bit about the 1936 uh, revolt, the Arab revolt, which lasted up to 1939. But in between, we also had the Peel Commission of 1937. Mm -hmm. So a couple of things to um, uh, unpack here. Right. But first, let's start yeah. with 1936. What happened in 1936 that led to the revolt? Do tell us about that. Yeah, so in 1936, one thing to, that to kind of remember too in um, this history is these are fairly brief periods of time, right? That it, this is only about less, less than 20 years after Brit, the Belfort Declaration, after, less than 20 years after the British invasion of Ottoman Palestine, um, a grassroots uh, rural, quite spontaneous rebellion uh, breaks out in Palestine. And this rebellion then was also to some extent um, framed not just against the British Empire, against re responding to their fears of Zionism, the mm -hmm. extent to which Zionism represented um, um, the the uh, an obstacle to their own aspirations for self determination, but is also to some extent against their own leadership. These large landowners, who in many ways were implicated in the indirect rule mechanisms that were developed by the British, right? Mm -hmm. 
So it becomes quite problematic for everybody, right? And so the British respond to that as they always do with a commission, right? I mean, there are multiple commissions. There's a very good book out by Laurie Allen that right. talks about the about this phenomenon of, of, of commission after commission in Palestine. And, and this is the Peel Commission. And when the Peel Commission looks at this, right? So clearly at this point, it had become aware. It's not the first time an internet, a British commission had reached this conclusion, right? Mm -hmm. Right from the outset, British officials on the ground said, we can't do this. This experiment won't work. Right. Um, we cannot impose a Jewish um, uh, state structure on the on an indigenous pop Arab population that doesn't want to live in a Jewish national home. London thought differently, but for different reasons over those 16 years, London thought they could pull this off. But really, those demonstrations proved, um, as, as was revealed in this commission by Peel in 1937, that the mandate wasn't working. Not only was it not working, this experiment of these of, of bringing these two people together in Palestine, but it was the source of the conflict. Mm -hmm. So they concluded right. that the mandate had to end. And right. that was the yeah. major conclusion. But they also tacked on this idea of partition. Right. It was kind of a, a hurried sketch map at the end. Mm -hmm. But what was interesting about that for me is by putting partition on the table for discussion, it meant that another more technical commission with more information at hand within two years or within a year or so looked at partition and said, we can't do this. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, South Asia, Ireland, uh, Turkey, you, you know, partition might somehow make sense in a report or uh, in, you know, the, the writer of the Peel Commission lived, was in Oxford, but on the ground, people don't live that way. Right. Right. And so yeah. the, the, the next commission to come out to look at partition said, we can't, we, it's, it's impossible. And I think yeah. that's the real significance here is mm -hmm. that recognition that we can't, that Palestine cannot be partitioned without causing a grave injustice to the Arab inhabitants of the area. So by 1939, Right. Yeah. When after another two years of serious rebellion, one of the great mm -hmm. one of the greatest colon anti-colonial rebellions in the mm -hmm. empire, the British basically say, uh, uh, basically accept at that point in 1939 that, no, we cannot we, we, we cannot take on the promise of a Jewish state here. And then they also say, you know, the fudge of the Belfort Declaration. We never really mm -hmm. promised that in the first place. Right. We promised yeah. a national home after British yeah. foreign policy making. So in many ways, I would see that 1939 white paper that mm -hmm. basically says to Palestinians the way in 1936, France said to Syria, the British said to Egypt and 30, Britain said to Iraq, um, in fulfillment of an A mandate, you will be independent. Mm -hmm. And I think that's yeah. the architectural period. Right. Then, you know, World War II happens. Mm -hmm. And if I can, I know you want to ask more, but just to... It, again, you know, in terms of the history of this conflict and the and the different contours and turning points, World War One and World War Two, so important. The two most important turning points to the con to the to understand this conflict, and neither have anything to do with Palestine, mm. and yet they completely mm. upend um, everything uh, to do with the lives of the people on the ground. Mm, for Sorry, sure, Omar, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm happy to go on a little further. My responses are taking too long. <laughs> oh, not a problem, Professor. So I'm really enjoying the discussion, and I and I do thank you for that. Yeah, uh, <laughs> okay, so just two questions with regards to the 1936 to 39 time period, Professor. So in addition to not having a constitution or a legislative assembly, um, do you believe mm -hmm. that the fact that a lot of the Palestinian leaders were killed off during this 1936 to 39 period may have also added to or, or exasperated the future ambitions of self-determination for the Palestinians? Um, do tell us about Absolutely. that. Yeah. Yeah, and here Rashid Khalidi has explained this and and very very well in right. in various articles, but also in a, a more recent book on the Hundred Year War. Right. So so in that sense, I mean, he talks about something like ten percent of the population mm -hmm. right, being yeah. afflicted by this. So it was really a, a very very brutal mechanisms placed put in place these counterinsurgency methods, um, uh, killings, um, destruction, but then also exiles. So mm -hmm. in that sense, you had a population that had risen in revolt against the British Empire from 36 to 39, but mm -hmm. put down very, very brutally, and then was in no position within the next 10 years to mm -hmm. rise again in resistance. And hence, um, one, of the, um, one of the factors that helps explain the, uh, the Israeli, the Jewish Yeshuv victory in the fighting from 47 to 49. We can talk about that in a moment. Right. But... Um, um, but it, it, there was, how to put it, at the same time as Britain did uh, deploy those uh, brutal counterinsurgency methods against Palestine, they also realized that this is not 
uh, sustainable. And so by 1939, they also uh, 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 they also uh, agreed to a new white paper, the 1939 white paper, which basically mm -hmm. puts an end to the Balfour Declaration. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes yeah. people lose sight of that, that, that there was that. Kind there was of an attempt to. Yeah. Uh, okay. yeah. Because it basically said, yep, you will be as with other colonial settings. Right. I mean, they didn't say this will happen immediately mm -hmm. uh, in terms of independence. And when they say independence, it's with quotation marks, right? We know mm -hmm. this in Iraq, <laughs> Egypt, elsewhere, right? right? Yes, you're independent, but uh, of, in mm -hmm. terms of day-to-day -day administration, but we'll control your foreign policy, we'll mm -hmm. control, at least that was the idea. Right. But then World right. War II completely disrupts all those notions again. Mm -hmm. And so For we sure. can, so if we think about how disruptive um, World War I was, and we've already talked about how disruptive World War II is, right? right. I yeah. also think we have to, then it, it's a guard against drawing any kind of straight line between 1917 mm -hmm. and to the present. Mm -hmm. Right. right. So I, yeah. I, my point of these turning points isn't to put them on some kind of straight trajectory to the present. Mm -hmm. It's to understand just how right. twisted this road is and to also alert ourselves to the various um, other paths and routes this conflict could have taken had it not been for those interventions. For, for sure. And uh, as I said before, Professor, I don't mind the linear progression at all because it makes it so much easier for a lay uh, audience to follow the plot line, so to say. But uh, I forgot to ask you the second question with regards to the 1936-39 conflict. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, with regards to the 1937 Peel Commission, uh, which was implemented in some form or the other uh, 10 years down the line in 1947. So, so the second question I actually had with regards to that time period, Professor, is, um, is the fact that I just wanted to bring in another uh, partition into the discussion. As you know that I'm based mm -hmm. in Dhaka, Bangladesh, and we went through our own partition when in 1947 when we were still a part of Pakistan. And so on the Indian side, you had Jawaharlal Nehru and uh, Mahatma Gandhi. And on the Pakistan side, you had Muhammad Ali Jinnah. And my mm -hmm. knowledge of the Indian partition is that uh, both Jinnah and Nehru had numerous iterations and roundtable discussions with Lord Mountbatten, the Viceroy of India. But with regards to the 1947 uh, partition of Palestine, it seems as though uh, there was only the Israeli representatives, but there really wasn't anybody on the Palestinian side who was ready to play ball. Now, perhaps you could tell us more, Professor, as to why that was. I mean, why didn't, I mean, after the initial rejection of the UN partition plan, why didn't we see yeah. some more iterations or more roundtable discussions before Ben Gurion just suddenly decided to proclaim independence? You know, your thoughts on that, please. Yeah. So there are a number of things happening here, I think. And one is um, we one, one understand requires a closer look at the leadership structures amongst the Palestinians and their failures during all of this. And um, yeah. part of it is the the extent to which Britain had. Um, had had developed um, a certain uh, uh, mechanisms of indirect rule in Palestine that promoted um, a, a, a more traditional way, a more Ottoman, oh, sorry, I shouldn't say that, a more traditional way of organizing Palestinian communal life. And that was to, to focus on the role of these large landowners, right, and mm -hmm. use them as intermediaries. This is something that the Ottomans had done uh, had relied upon in the early 19th century. But then for reasons that I tried to consider, this was something that the Ottoman Empire was trying to get away with. They were looking in the 19th century for to develop more direct in, um, uh, connections with every individual um, who is now considered a citizen and a tax paying citizen. So when, in fact, the British kind of bring back these large landowners, they're often referred to as notables in the literature. Mm -hmm. They're, in fact, reversing the sort of modernization, the modernizing techniques of the Ottoman Empire. The, mm -hmm. that, that is to say, the British Empire, which justified itself in terms of modernization, was, in fact, you know, reimposing, resolidifying more traditional methods. So there's that. There's the extent to which the British, the British in fact, relied upon these more traditional um, uh, 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 ways of, of, of organizing. Uh, uh, political life in Palestine based on large the, the the role of notables and individuals, but they did so also in a very indirect rule is also accompanied by divide and rule as we know. So they're mm -hmm. also setting these notables up against each other to mm -hmm. to ensure that the more problematic for them to rise in unison, which right. is why in 1936 when the people something much more horizontal in terms of an identity emerges. That was kind of very significant in terms of a um, 
a way of organizing political life contrary to the more uh, uh, patron-client um, vertical um, uh, lines of leadership established by the British. So um, in that sense, the notable politics was not up to the task in 1947. They were um, uh, part of notable politics was the division between each other, between between different groups, too. So it made it quite difficult mm. for them to come together under a certain plan, mm. lest it promote one individual over another. So right. there was that. Okay. Um, I think there was also the feeling that this was always quite unfair to begin with. So mm. when 1947 when the British um, do announce their withdrawal from 1947, it goes into the United Nations and the United Nations puts together a commission. This is a commission at the United Nations in which Canada actually plays a very, very important mm. role. Mm -hmm. This is a commission that will call for partition in Palestine. Um, hence, I always emphasize this in audiences mm. that if Canadians ever wonder, you know, why should we care about this part of the world? Canada has a responsibility mm. in terms of creating this, the, the dynamics this of this. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, as, as does America, as does Germany, mm. as does well, of course Britain. Mm. But what I want to say here is the United Nations made it very clear that when they were putting partition back on the table, as it was, it was with the Holocaust and World War II in mind. Right. right? So this leadership in Palestine kind of looked at, um, to the extent that they were able to come to the table and represent a Palestinian position, made so difficult, right, by British mm. mechanisms of rule and yeah. the counterinsurgency methods of the, in 1939 that depleted their resources. They, they weren't really, what did you say, play ball, in part because they thought it was so grossly unfair in the first place, right? right. Why, should the, why should Palestine be, be a responsible mm. for coming up to a solution for the hundreds of thousands of Jewish displaced persons, refugees in, Palestine, in Europe, some of whom still living in the camps, the survivors of the death camps, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. why, why isn't Europe stepping forward mm. to, um, to, 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 to deal with those, you know, co uh, the consequences from all of that and seek some kind of rehabilitation as might have been possible for those survivors, mm. let alone Canada, let alone the United States, which weren't at all interested in opening mm. their doors. So uh, I think that's part of it. Too. Oh, sorry, sorry. Just to, um, sorry to interrupt you, Professor. Um, uh, speaking of Canada and the U.S. and and settler colonialism, I just wanted to ask you a very tangential question. Do you believe that um, the the settler atrocities against Native Americans and what can Canadians did to their First Nations may have actually, and the fact that it's not really studied in school curriculum, U.S. or Canadian school curriculum may have also uh, helped North Americans in general turn a blind eye to the settler colonial policies that Israel uh, implemented uh, in 1947 and onwards. And till this day, uh, you know, treating Palestinians as second class citizens with no rights, even though they are living under an apartheid regime in the West Bank um, and till 2005 in Gaza. So what are your thoughts on that? Do you believe that this is something that needs to change in a North American school curriculum? to help empathize with Palestinians? Yep. That's absolutely, that's exactly what needs to happen. I don't know exactly how one informs the other to get to respond to that part of your question. Mm -hmm. To what extent was Canada as a settler colonial, white settler colonial nation, to what extent did that in, in and of itself inform Canadian policies um, in, um, in, in Palestine? Because in part, um, uh, Canada supported the 1939 white paper of an independent Palestine right up until the uh, United Nations Special Committee. And at that point, I think the Canadians represented on it really had the Holocaust and the Jewish displaced persons in mind. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, I, I, I think it is so extremely important to understand settler colonial frameworks in a comparative perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, and we don't do that enough. Mm -hmm. No, no, uh, right. that's not to say they're all the same. Right? Yeah. They're, very, uh, they're very unique. I know that it's a particularly uh, sensitive subject mm -hmm. to refer to Zionism as a settler colonial um, a movement. Uh, uh, in part because of the power of that claim or accusation, right? right. On the other hand, um, Zionist leaders themselves viewed Zionism in this interwar period and before in settler colonial terms, which I think right. you know can be understandable given given how settler colonialism was viewed at that time. Mm -hmm. But yeah. um, if if I could, um, I suppose we have to wrap up soon. Don't yeah. So maybe I yes, have more of a personal uh, note. Yeah. But at the university. We often introduce, we, we're, we're, we, we, uh, colleagues will introduce mm. our, um, our talks in public with a land acknowledgement. 
where we right. acknowledge that we are living, working, raising families and 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 commuting uh, uh, to on homes and universities that sit on the traditional territories mm. of the First Nations. First Nations, yeah. Um, and and right. so when I make that acknowledgement, you know, there's it's it, you, you 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 need to do it in a very you, one one can one does it in a very genuine way. Mm -hmm. It's not as opposed to sort of um. Um, a, a, a quick, a quick comment, and and yeah. in that sense, to draw to draw the attention to the dispossession and expulsion of mm. of Palestinians is there's a there's a there's all sorts of room there for a comparative perspective. I just mm -hmm. will add here that to refer to Zionism uh, to suggest that Zionism can be usefully understood in terms of settler colonial frameworks, which has been mm -hmm. done by uh, Jewish Israeli scholars. Gershon Shapir wrote a remar remarkable mm -hmm. book in the late eighties on this. That doesn't that doesn't negate the fact that it was also a movement of national liberation as emerged in the late 19th century for reasons that we talked about at the outset of this conversation. Mm -hmm. It can be both. It can be both. Okay. On the, on, on the biblical ancestral the, territory. Right, right. So, well, uh, well, I, for one, Professor, as, uh, as somebody who's graduated from a Canadian institution, I am quite pleased to hear that, uh, you know, there is uh, now that awareness uh, with regards to Canada's dark past, with regards to the First Nations and right. etc., and if if it is uh, if the winds of change are happening, uh, since because I wasn't aware of it, so I do thank you for uh, informing me about it. Um, so, Professor, as you as you said, uh, oh. come again. Sorry. I, so it's gradual. It's slow. There's still a lot more. Oh, there's still a lot done. more work to be done. Okay. Oh, so yeah. and uh, and Godspeed with regards to that happening. So, Professor, as you rightly said, we are pretty much coming to the end of our discussion today. I, I've really enjoyed it a lot. But just before I let you go, uh, I would like to ask you two staple questions that we always have and uh, that we always ask all of our guests on the show. And um, and uh, so let, let me just make it very quick. Um, uh, as you know, that our show is called Book Cafe Podcast. So the word book is in the title. So the two questions that we have are with regards to books. And the first question is, um, are you more of a fiction person or a nonfiction person? What genre of books do you enjoy reading? And so I'm more of a nonfiction. I just can't keep mm. up with all that is written um, mm. uh, on the subject. Um, and there's so much more being produced right now than there was 30 years ago when I was starting to study. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, that's books. But where do you find where do I find time to read books anymore, <laughs> given all of the like, well podcasts, but mm -hmm. also um, mm -hmm. all of the material online. So that takes up far too much of my time and in okay. part just trying to understand the twists and turns of every tragic day in the Middle okay. East right now. So, okay. But one thing I have been trying to spend more, much more time doing is reading Arabic fiction. Like, okay, Arabic fiction. Just wow. Yeah, just some okay. incredible uh, Palestinian, Iraqi, Syrian mm -hmm. writers right now who are right. who are writing um, beautifully about um, the the uh, many about the tragedies unfolding. You know, but, but um, I try to spend more and more time. Right. Okay. Reading, reading. Okay, yeah. awesome. Thank you so much for that, Professor. So the second stable question, and uh, let me just give a preamble by saying that I've been told by all of our guests till date that it's a really tough question. But given that you're such an avid reader, I'm sure you can give us a really good answer to it. And the question is, um, if you could select a book that you feel that every young person should read at least once in their lifetime, it may be a fiction book, it may be a nonfiction book, it could be related to history or to geopolitics. But if you could pick only one book, what would be your pick? Oh, yeah. Then you put me on the spot here. <laughs> so not necessarily about Palestine, Israel. No, it could be about anything in the world, but it's something that's edifying and useful. Yeah. You know, I just had it. I, I was just thinking of this a few days ago that if I could recommend any book, I would point to that one. But has anybody actually um, asked for more time to think about it or has everybody given you an answer? Oh, no, no. Um, it, it, it varies, but, you know, do take your time, you know. Uh, and uh, if you'd like well, to give a let long me throw this one out. I know it's a bit yeah. of a, a cop because um, it's on the subject. And so um, I'm not drawing on the on, on as wide a pool, which, of course, would make it more difficult. But I've just been reading um, some short stories and novels by Garson Kanafani, a Palestinian author. Wow! Yeah. Wow! And 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 so his his return to Haifa, 
um, which I've, I, I first read 20 or 30 years ago, Return to Haifa was remarkable. Mm -hmm. And then maybe for the sense of balance, and I hate sometimes the idea of balance, because of course, okay. there's multiple sides here. There's not a Palestinian mm -hmm. side and a Jewish side so far, as literature goes. Mm -hmm. But I also read the Masad's Tales of Light and, Light and Darkness, and okay. I was quite moved by that as well. That, that is Masad's incredible. Account. Yeah. Well, Professor, I but have to tell you... you you gave it, you gave me two yes and and I really appreciate that. In fact, I will tell you something else, Professor. This is the first time we've ever had two authors on the show give us the exact same recommendation. So just the uh, episode prior to this one, we were very privileged to speak to Professor Dr. Rebecca Ruth Gould from the University of London. Um, she wrote a book mm -hmm. called uh, Erasing Palestine. It came out just last year, and she also gave us Gassan Kanfani's uh, name um, and talked about. Uh, mm -hmm. She did yes. And uh, yeah. and yeah, so this is the first time we've ever had two authors on the show. Oh, that is interesting. That is really yeah. interesting. So yeah, so her episode. And in part, is I just I, yeah, I just read it uh, in the last yeah. uh, reread it, and okay. it's, it's actually quite a powerful, moving book. So that's I think one reason why it's yeah. W wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Okay, so yeah. on that note, uh, let me just conclude by saying that for our viewers and listeners who have been with us all this time, thank you very much for staying till the end. If you are watching this episode on YouTube, please be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit that bell icon. The episode will also be available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. The book, once again, is The Palestinian-Israeli Conflict, a very short introduction by Professor Dr. Martin Bunton. Professor, my thanks to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed talking to you. You've been a wonderful guest, and I really hope that well, we Martin, get a chance really to talk to you this. again. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Well, there'll be a second edition, hopefully. Second soon. edition. And we have to talk about that as well. By the way, what time period well, will you be looking at? 2007 to 17 or 27? Very quickly. That's right. It'll take it. It'll be a new chapter since 2007. Yeah. Okay. 2007, Hamas, Gaza, Fatah split, West Bank, Gaza, a lot happening that way. So, yeah. right. Okay. But how to deal with the present is really, really tricky. Awesome. So, we'll, be, we'll definitely keep our eyes peeled for that. Thank you so much, Professor. Have a good day and let's catch up soon. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank mm -hmm. you.